Hello and welcome fellow motorsports fans. What a week of single-seater racing it has been with British emerging superstars performing incredibly well on various different levels of racing and I am here to talk all about it. But as always, there was also a bunch of different Formula 4 action, which is where we'll begin. So in this first chapter, we have the slightly lower level Formula 4 series, although I have to say for the Japanese F4 in particular, this label almost feels a little bit unfair because yes, it is an incredibly national series with in fact, I think only Japanese drivers actually competing. But obviously Japan has a very rich motorsports history and heritage and still incredibly strong drivers. So actually probably a couple of really good guys will come out of this series eventually. So it's worth to keep an eye on it. Also, and this will be a theme, but uh, the production quality of Japanese F4 is amazing. You can tell it is part of a bigger broadcast and of a you know, proper relevant broadcast, not something like Italian GT. Sorry, Italians, but you, you know how it is. So um, yeah, it is just really nice to watch, even if it is only in Japanese. Now, the racing itself was interesting and had some you know, very curious <laughs> incidents, shall we say. First up, we have Shimbara, the driver who, in my opinion, looked to be the quickest throughout the weekend, didn't manage to get a single, you know, deserved result, as in he didn't actually win a race or even get onto a podium, because in race one, I'll show you here, his uh, direct rival, Moriyama, did take him out quite egregiously, resulting in a penalty for Moriyama then, at least, fair enough. And in the second race, he stalled on the grid, had a really good recovery drive, but unfortunately, once again, no podium. So this leaves us with a very sort of odd power dynamic with two of the protagonists, at least Chimbara and Moriyama did appear to be the protagonists this weekend and neither had a perfect or close to perfect weekend if that makes sense. So it'll be very interesting going forward. The really big story though, and I will quote Formula Scout here, is an, a kind of bizarre engine issue that apparently happened between the first and the second race, which more or less resulted in 10 DNS in the second race, 10 different cars not actually eligible to start due to you know, non-function engines, presumably. So um, really bizarre. This included all three of the podium sitters in the first race, which already meant the second one would have quite interesting results. Although, as I said, the two protagonists weren't actually on the podium in race one, so they were still competing in the second one. But yeah, I don't know. This is not supposed to happen in junior formula racing. Basically, the only thing you have to ensure if you're organizing the series is Please make sure everybody has equipment that won't break down, you know, at random, like make sure you get a proper engine partner or whatever. Um, I don't know the detail, like the technical details of what happened at all. So you can let me know down in the comments because that's an interesting story, but I haven't had time to look into it further. Anyway, time to go a little further to the West. Let's talk about Australian F4. Australian F4 finally returning after a few years of absence and you know as expected for a returning smaller F4 series didn't exactly have a strong grid for its first time out. The car count is actually okay but over half of the entries were masters entries so no young aspiring pro drivers so not super duper interesting. But nonetheless, first of all, it'll grow. I'm sure it'll grow. And second of all, with James Pizik there, we actually at least had a very, very good benchmark driver to, you know, kind of gauge what the other uh, pro or young professional drivers are up to. And we had a super static order throughout the three races, so it's quite easy there. We had Purdy as a very established second best driver ahead of uh, Nicholas Statti, who we already knew from all the Winter Series stuff. But just by that, I would have expected him to be the second one. But I mean, how can you expect a guy you've never heard about, you know? Um, so that was him. And then you had Gilmore and Amadio sort of battling for P4 and P5 in all of the races. And yeah, those were the five protagonists. The gaps were still pretty, pretty big. Pizik in particular was just absolutely dominant as you'd really expect from him. But uh, yeah, we will see how this develops over the course of the season. As the rookies get more and more experience, I'm sure things will close up a little bit. The thing I actually want to highlight with this series though is, and please take note, everyone else organizing series is how good was that broadcast? Like it's very bare bones. You can tell obviously there's no huge, huge money behind it, I don't think. And yes, it's part of a bigger package of, to me, unknown racing series. So, you know, no super large stuff. 
and it had everything you needed. And this is really, it shows that it, you don't need much to have a very well working racing broadcast. Just let me show you this grid rundown graphic here, which it doesn't look fancy, it doesn't look great by any means, but it includes all of the vital information I need before the race. It tells me where the drivers start, their names, the teams they drive for, and the car number so I can actually spot them on the grid or um, you know, link up name to the timing tower if there's only an abbreviation and there's you know, more drivers with similar names, all of that good stuff. So really, this is all the information you need. Not, there's nothing more I need. I don't need any sponsors. I don't need to know where they come from, but yeah, this, this is the vital stuff and it really blows my mind that a lot of broadcasters just seem to fail at this very simple task. Same with the actual in-race broadcasts where really the only thing you need is a timing tower that's updated regularly and that shows ideally a gap of some sort, the car number and the name. That's it. That's all I need and yet it, some broadcasters just fail at that or use the old scroll thing which is just outdated and annoying to be frank so yeah whatever rant over let's go to f1 academy <laughs> second round of f1 academy in at miami and honestly this was a really surprising one obviously during the first round remember dorian Parr didn't actually get to win both of the races because she got penalized for taking a check at flag twice yada 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 and i was there saying you know it's only sad because it ruined her chance at doing the perfect season but it really shouldn't matter going forward now, Abby Pulling it did definitely prove me wrong there because first of all, winning all the races in the season is uh, way off the table now because in fact it was Abby Pulling dominating both of those races. Uh, yeah, I want to use the term dominate because she actually did so at least very convincingly, in particular the second one, which another thing we need to highlight in the second one, Dory wasn't even second. She got beat by Bianca Bustamante on merit and that was really beautiful to watch. I'm not here to dig on Dory. I'm here to highlight uh, that yes, actually the competition is slowly leveling up. Maybe, you know, this whole F1 Academy project is actually useful going forward and there is a little more talent than we may have thought uh, in this particular grid already, not just in the future grids that they will build. One particular thing to prove this is that Maya Wirth, for example, was really nowhere this weekend. Nowhere meaning compared to where we expected her to be. She was obviously very, very solid in the upper midfield, but not really a front-running presence whatsoever. So once again, hey, we were praising her last year for doing well in Freca and everything. So yeah, again, maybe there is just a tad more talent here. The last thing I want to highlight is how the mid-pack in general was a lot tighter this time around and this was largely aided and we talked about it after the first round. Uh, MP Motorsports actually brought a real car this time and which which means Ham Hamda Alkibaisi in particular could actually challenge. We obviously we know she's quality in F4 machinery so no surprises there as she was at least able to you know make her mark in the upper mid-pack. Last but not least, Tina Hausmann, who I am keeping an eye on because I thought, you know, she's low-key underrated going into this, but unfortunately she found the wall twice on the opening lap. And uh, if I remember correctly, with help both of the times, definitely one of the times. So just a very unfortunate weekend. I hope she can bounce back from this, but we already know combined with a very, you know, mediocre to bad Saudi outing, this already means her final standing will probably be quite poor compared to where she should be. But uh, yeah, anyway, we'll keep an eye on her development. Now it's finally time for Italian F4. Italian F4, the best F4 series out there, period. I don't even think there is really a discussion at this point. It's where most of the junior drivers go if they have the chance. It's where Prema is operating um, and it's just an incredibly stacked grid throughout. Before we talk about individual drivers, I do want to highlight Prema brought an insane lineup of drivers, six quality competitors, and obviously we know they know how to set up an F4 car effectively, and yet both US Racing, Van Amersfoort Racing, and more surprisingly even Jensa actually brought the 5-2 Prema to an extent. Now, yes, obviously Prema did get a 1-2 in all the races, and we'll talk about it in a second, but I just want to point out that it's not the Prema train that we've seen in some of the years of the past. This is very much reminiscent of last year where there will be lots of different cars in the mix when the drivers are, you know, on point that weekend, basically. Now, talking individuals, 
obviously the big guy, Freddie Slater. I've talked about him in the intro. The guy who's, you know, often been compared to Norris. So I find it quite fitting that he had a perfect season opening year, securing the hat-trick. Um, obviously in my prediction video about the karting graduates linked up here somewhere. I've, I've talked extensively about Slater being the most promising guy out of karts this season. But um, yeah, this level of domination is obviously hard to actually predict. I am really glad it happened. I had had hoped this would happen, but uh, wouldn't have dared to actually say so out loud, basically. So yeah, here we, here we are now. Um, maybe Slater will follow the footsteps of, you know, Oli Behrman and Kimi Antonelli and be the next guy in the F1 conversation very, very soon. Well, not the next guy, but you know what I mean. The Norris comparisons are always a bit interesting and in case you aren't aware they come from the fact that they are both from incredibly wealthy backgrounds which means Slater is also in the fortunate position of not actually needing to tie himself to an F1 academy or anything because he can just you know pay his way into F2 essentially and then pick an appropriate team which actually has a decent chance of offering him a real seat in the near future and you know to prevent the Piastri situation of getting stuck in Alpine prison somewhere, essentially. So he will be in that conversation in a couple of years, no doubt about it in my mind. But until then, there's a few more young drivers we need to monitor. One of them being Alex Powell, who I've said this before the season, I hoped he would show more because obviously him, Slater and KNB were sort of the three big boys at Prema. And uh, during the F4 UAE, only two of those showed up and it was Powell who was sort of a little bit out of it. Now, I don't want to make it sound like he was terrible, but by no means was he terrible, but just a tiny step below his two teammates. And this time that wasn't really the case anymore. Obviously, he, he beat Kinnakama Roberta very convincingly in all those races. And just cruising at home in P2 three races in a row uh, can never be a bad thing. That's a really, really good start for a season. Yes, he didn't really bring the fight to Slater, but then again, I didn't really think there was a need to. Now, we can't talk about all the Prema drivers in one go, but there is two more I do want to point out. One of them being Thomas Stolzmanis, who is a bit of a secret fan favorite for me. I don't know, I love Thomas. I think he's a bit of, an, bit of an, a cool underdog to root for, basically. And unfortunately, he had a very poor qualifying, but I thought he made really good recovery work in the actual races. I think he scored points in all or two of the three i think he got a penalty or something whatever he did a very decent job working his way through the mid pack and in particular he did a much better job than more experienced dion gauda who once again much like in the f4 uae was just a bit lackluster this level of performance unfortunately just won't really cut it if, if you're driving for prema there is a higher expectation there i'm afraid Obviously, a grid as stacked as the Italian F4 grid makes it hard to highlight every single driver in one episode, so I won't. But there's two more guys we need to point out, and they are the two big surprises in a way. First up, we've got Hiyo Yamakoshi, who obviously he's experienced and everything, but I certainly did not expect him to just win the midfield outright in a lot of these races in his Van Amersfoort. So that was certainly a pleasant surprise and i guess if he can keep up that consistency he will at least be like a badoea kind of character stealing a few wins here and there and probably not being in the actual championship conversation i think that'll be firmly between the premier boys this time around then again i said so last year as well so what do i know but he will certainly keep making an impact or at least i hope so because this was a really really impressive weekend from him the guy who impressed me even more, because I didn't actually know him before and except for his one-off round at the F4 UAE, where I even said, yeah, it's probably not worth talking about, it's only a one-off round. I didn't even mention him in my season recap, and that's Reno Franco, who, uh, or Re Reno Franco names, eh, um, who did a wicked job in the Gensa, despite a lack of experience and kept the thing in the points basically throughout the weekend. That was really fantastic to see. And that was an achievement that last year was entirely unheard of. Like the Gensa was just not capable of scoring points without at least like six DNFs further up the road or something. So what an incredible drive. Yes, obviously Gensa I think leveled up. Ethan Isher was also there, was also performing well. So it's not all on the driver. You can't outdrive your car to that extent anyway. But nonetheless, for a guy I had sort of zero expectations for, he's certainly surprised. And from now on, I will have very high expectations for him. Now, let's move on to Formula One. 
There's only really one story we have to cover here and that is obviously Landon Norris finally, finally getting his first win. That's the sort of feeling that I think every fan was rooting for him. I'm a Verstappen fan to an extent as much as I'm a fan of any driver really. But uh, obviously there was no, no, no chance I'm rooting for Max in that scenario, right? Like this was such a feel-good storyline and I feel like one the entire F1 world deserved to an extent or at the very least it needed. Um, Yes, some salty Hamilton fans on the internet, that's always good fun on the side for me. But nonetheless, yeah, I don't think there is as huge a caveat around this win as some people try to make it out. Yes, he did get the very important track position under the safety car. But then after the safety car, he also sort of just drove off. Apparently, Max had some floor damage, either from Paris or the bollard or something. I've read multiple headlines. I haven't gone through all the recap news. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff coming out. Either way, he may or may not have had a slightly impacted car. Nonetheless, uh, at the end of the day, we are here to judge what we can see with our own eyes. And it was as clear as day Norris had the pace to win this race. He may have even had the pace to get an overtake done on track the way he was get gapping away. Now, probably not. That's still highly unlikely. And obviously, Verstappen won't just get out of the way just because someone's a little bit quicker behind him. But I'm just saying this was nowhere near as lucky as some people try to make it out to be. Now, I think this is quite obvious if you've got, you know, eyeballs. So I think we're all right there anyway. There was more storylines paying out throughout the weekend though. Uh, a thing I want to highlight personally was Sainz aggressive battling with Piastri just because in my at least recent memory, I can't recall Sainz driving this aggressively. Like he got really angry after Piastri shoved him off the road or something at least from Sainz's point of view that's what happened and uh, then yeah that dive bomb where he essentially ruined Piastri's race. Very entertaining and just very un-Carlos like I don't know what's going on there if he's just found some sort of new fire in him or something I've, I've got no clue what's going on but I was really intense to watch and not the Carlos that I know and love but uh, I do like this version as well not gonna lie. A guy who we do know to drive like a bit of a cunt every now and then is K-Mag and he was back at it and I will show as many clips as I can without Liberty striking the video. But essentially he did incredibly dodgy defensive tactics in the sprint race and yes he came out afterwards saying it was to secure the gap for Hülkenberg to bring home the point and everything and listen probably even true to at least an extent but nonetheless I feel like he is overdoing it even if that is the team game and then obviously uh, he took out Sargent in the feature race which is just a shame especially because rumor has it this could be Sargent's last race in F1 or at least there is a tiny chance that this could have been the last race for Sargent and then I mean what a horrible way to end it because the last big rumor in town and the thing we have to talk about is Williams asking for special permission to get Kimi Antonelli into F1 as soon as possible. Um, obviously as a big Kimi fan this is supposed to be great news I am on the fence about this just because it sounds like an incredible risk. Now, I don't think he will get the special permission. There's not really precedent for that. I, I don't know if, if that should happen or anything. We will know in a few weeks, but um, I wouldn't hold my breath, basically, I guess. Nonetheless, let's just assume this was about to happen and let's talk about it anyway. And for me personally, I don't, I don't see the need of that risk. Now, clearly, he has done something in his private tests of the Mercedes F1 car that has impressed the entire paddock essentially. So whatever he's done during those tests has shown a lot of potential and probably also has shown that he won't need a lot of time adapting to the car or at least that's what they think. Otherwise, why would you put him in mid-season to replace a struggling driver? Like, the Williams is so far off that it's not like you can plug in anyone really, really good and expect him to score points every week. So why put in a rookie who's probably going to take weekends to adapt? I've got no idea. The second thing this brings up is what about 2025? Because at least personally, I can't imagine Williams would agree to taking on Kimi for only half a season. Like what's there to gain for Williams? I think they would only ever agree to this if they get him for 2025 as well and then basically have a capable driver in that seat in exchange for you know warming them up for Mercedes so to speak. Anyway 
Let me know down in the comments what you make of Norris' win and the Kimi situation. Would you like to see him in uh, Imola already in the F1 car or would you prefer him in F2? I would personally really like to see him win an F2 race before he steps up, you know. I feel like also on his CV at the end of his career that, that would be a piece missing. But then again, he didn't do F3 either and nobody cares. So either way, let me know down in the comments. The other thing I want to just quickly shout out, thank you so much for all the support during the last video in particular, uh, pushed the channel over the 400 subscribers. So once again, thank you all so much. And I just quickly want to highlight since a lot of you said, oh, how is this channel so small? I sometimes, you know, wonder myself. And uh, the only thing I can do is, you know, keep pumping out those videos. But if you want to help the channel grow a little, obviously you can do all the YouTube stuff like subscribe, yada, yada, yada. But more importantly, share with like-minded people, get your motorsports friends and show them this channel and see if they like it. Because I think that's the only consistent way to actually, you know, find some more people interested in talking about single-seater racing every week. Now, all of this out of the way. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.